Okay, folks, ready or not, we are less than 20 days away from Christmas. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but there's your fair warning. But by now, you probably have your decorations hung and your Christmas tree set up. You know, at our house, we actually have two Christmas trees going. We have an artificial tree decorated upstairs, and then we have a fresh cut tree down in our living room. And on both of our trees, it's, it's our family tradition to put an angel on top. Maybe you do something similar. But do you know where that tradition came from uh, to put an angel on top of the Christmas tree? I, I didn't know, and so I kind of looked into it and found out that way back in December of 1848, after the London Illustrated News published a picture of England's Queen Victoria and Prince Albert decorating their tree with an angel on top. Everyone, it seemed, Brits and Americans alike, they decided to follow this trend and begin to place the angel at the top of the tree. And I suppose that makes sense that, that angels top our trees since these, these heavenly creatures, these, these heavenly beings feature so prominently in the Christmas story. And in fact, just earlier when our Advent candles were lit, we heard the familiar story of the angel's announcement to Mary, where the angel said, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Of course, one of the greatest angelic announcements in all of Scripture then was given to a field full of shepherds where they heard these words, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Now these familiar scenes, they tell us what happened surrounding those events of Jesus' birth. But we also know that Scripture gives us another perspective on that Christmas story. It not only tells us what happened when Jesus was born, but it also tells us why it happened. And this morning we're going to look at why the incarnation was necessary. We're going to look at the book of Hebrews and we're going to consider together four reasons why the Son of God became a human being. And, and although Hebrews sounds like something out of the Old Testament, we'll find this book of Hebrews near the end of the New Testament. Having said that, though, the original readers of this letter, they were well-versed in the Old Testament. And even though as we read through, we discover that this book is filled with quotations from the Hebrew Scriptures, in reading Hebrews, we come to discover that it is all about Jesus. So turn with me, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 2, and we're going to start in on verse 5. And there you'll notice that the writer of Hebrews says, It is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come about which we are speaking. Now, if, if we were to go back and read through chapter 1, we would see that the main argument up to this point in the letter, is that the Son of God is superior to angels in every way. Now, again, angels, they, they play a particularly important role, not only in the Christmas story, but, but really throughout the entire story of the Bible. And yet here we see that it wasn't to angels that God gave dominion over this world. You see, in God's original plan for this world, he gave dominion 
to a much more unlikely candidate. And you'll see it there in verse 6 that we're pointed actually back to the Old Testament, back to Psalm 8. And we're considering why it is that Christ became a man. Here in Hebrews, we just get a snippet of this quotation there in verses 6 to 8. But I think this is a relatively short psalm. And let's instead look at the psalm in its original context. This is from Psalm 8, which reads, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them, you have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. All flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Have you ever felt like that? You ever thought about how great God is and how relatively insignificant we are as human beings? You ever thought for a moment how incredible it must be to be an angel in the presence of God in heaven rather than a piddly little earth dweller? And yet we read that it wasn't to angels that God gave dominion over this world that God gave authority to men and to women, and, and, and even though he made humans a little lower than the angels, God crowned them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet. And by everything, we mean everything. It says right there in verse 8 that in putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. If we go back to the beginning of the story of the Bible, we read about God's original intention to create men and women and in his image and to entrust them with this dominion over the created world. Back in Genesis 1, we read these words. God said, let us make mankind in our image in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground so God made mankind in his own image in the image of God he created them male and female he created them God blessed them and said to them be fruitful and increase in number fill the earth and subdue it rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground God's original design was for his image bearers to rule over creation. God crowned Adam and Eve with glory and honor, and he put everything under their feet. But that wasn't good enough for the head of the human race and his wife. And so together they rebelled against their creator. They sinned by claiming more authority for themselves than what God had granted to them. And so we read in Hebrews 2, verse 8, what we actually already know to be true of the world that we live in, that yet at present, we do not see everything subject to them. You see, we don't see God's original design as described in Genesis 1 and 2. Rather, we live now in a post-Genesis 3 world, one where God's design has been corrupted by sin. And we ask, well, if what we see now is a fallen world and, and we see God's image bearers as tarnished by this rebellion, 
Well, what hope do we have? And the good news of Christmas is that we do have hope. And that hope is found there in verse 9 where we read these words, but we see Jesus. We see Jesus. Now, a generation before this letter to the Hebrews was written, there was an angel that appeared to Joseph. And in a dream he said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And so, yes, at, at Christmas time, we see the infant Jesus, the son of Mary and Joseph, lying in a manger. But we also need to see Jesus the way that the writer of Hebrews sees him. Verse 9, but we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. See, as the ultimate fulfillment of Psalm 8, we see Jesus made lower than the angels for a little while, which means that Jesus took on full humanity in order to undo the damage that was done by Adam's sin and by our continued rebellion against God. If you're a note taker, you might want to write some of these things down on that insert in your bulletin. But the first reason why the Son of God became a human being was so that he might fulfill God's original design for men and women. Jesus did what Adam failed to do. What we failed to do as sinners... Jesus fully obeyed his Father, and by God's grace, the sinless Jesus tasted death, the just penalty for human sin, and he did this on our behalf. And because he suffered and because he died, God crowned him with glory and honor. But there's more to the story. You see, not only does Jesus coming as a man fulfill God's original intention for humankind, second, the Son of God became a human being in order to fully restore God's image bearers to their original glory. Well, this year I decided to finally do something about our artificial Christmas tree at our house. You see, when we bought this thing a few years back, it came pre-strung with lights, right? You know how this works. Every year you put it up, you take it down, you put it up, you take it down. Well, over the years, more and more of these pre-lit strands, well, they stop working. And now at, at, at this point, whole sections of our tree were unlit. They no longer lit up. And so this year I decided to do something about it. I removed all of those strings that were, I found, securely fastened to each and every one of the branches and then finally replace them with new LED lights. And it looks much better. And when we think about Jesus' work of restoration, restoring us to the glory originally intended for us as God's image bearers, that, that might be the picture that you have in mind. We might think of Jesus coming to remove what is damaged and to replace it with what is good. But I think there's an even better picture of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. You see, out in a brush pile in our backyard, I also have last year's fresh Christmas tree. At least it was fresh. You see, when we bought it last year, it was a, a living tree. It was freshly cut down, and it filled our living room with that great Christmas tree smell. But today, it is dead. It is completely brown, 
It has almost no uh, needles left on its branches. And if I were to drag this thing into my house and set it up, there would be no possible way for me to restore this thing to its original glory. Because it's dead. You see, even Charlie Brown would turn this tree down. It's impossible to make dead trees live again. But it is not impossible for spiritually dead men and women to be made alive again and to be restored to their former glory. Because in Ephesians chapter 2, we read these words. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live, and when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following the desires and thoughts. And like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. In order to bring many sons and daughters to glory, it says here in Hebrews 2 verse 10 that it was absolutely necessary for God to send his son in order to trailblaze a way of freedom from sin for us. In order to restore God's image bearers, God, the son of God, had to take on sin's penalty. That penalty of death, he had to go through the suffering of death on our behalf. And to do this, he had to become one of us. He had to be made fully human. And so there's a third reason then why we're given, uh, that we're given here as to why Jesus had to be made fully human. We see it there in verse 14. That is that the Son of God became a human being in order to break the power of death and of the devil. In order for sinners like you and me to be brought into the family of God, the Son of God had to become our brother. He had to take on flesh and blood and share in our humanity. And by dying the death that we should have died... We read there in verse 14 that Jesus broke the power of him who holds the power of death, the devil. We might say that by his death, Jesus pulled the plug on death, depriving the devil of his power. We read those words, but I don't think many people today think too much about the devil nor his power. But every single person on this planet is well aware of the reality of death. Our news every day now is filled with statistics about those who are dying from COVID-19. And when the news isn't about the pandemic, we're hearing about war and terrorism and gun violence and other evils. And how many of us here in this room or watching at home attended a funeral, at least one funeral this year for a friend or loved one. You see, it's no wonder that we humans fear death. But you need to think about this for a moment. That the eternal Son of God willingly took on our humanity in order to become completely vulnerable to death. And though he did not deserve it, Jesus Christ fully accepted what we fear most in order to set us free from our enslavement to death. And just so we don't lose sight of God's amazing grace, we read then in verse 16 that Jesus didn't do this for the angels. He came for men and for women who, like the Old Testament patriarch Abraham, 
Trust in God's saving faith. And so the writer of Hebrews concludes this passage with one final reason why Jesus came as a man. That the Son of God became a human being in order to become our perfect representative and substitute. I don't know if many of you here or watching at home are science fiction fans. Even if you're not, you may be familiar with the concept of an android. You see, in the sci-fi world, an an android is one of these human-like beings that is typically flesh on the outside, but mechanical on the inside. And, And almost without fail in these sci-fi stories, the android character is found to be far inferior to the human being. They may have strength, the strength of a machine, they may have the mind of a computer, but they fall very short of what it means to be truly human. And we need to be very careful that we don't think of the Son of God incarnate in that same way. Because notice the emphasis there in verse 17 that Jesus had to be made like them, fully human in every way. Over the centuries of church history, Christians have worked to find the proper tension between Jesus as fully God and fully man. And often they've done this in response to errors that have tried to creep into Christian teaching. One of these responses happened many, many years ago in the year 451 AD, and it became known as the symbol or the creed of Chalcedon. It's a statement that probably sounds very strange to modern ears, but if you'll bear with me here for a moment this morning, I want to read this for us. In 451, they wrote, We then, following the Holy Fathers, all with one consent, teach men to confess one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in Godhead and also perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man, of a reasonable soul and body, consubstantial with us according to the manhood, in all things like unto us without sin, begotten before all ages of the Father according to the Godhead, and in these latter days, for us and for our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary, the mother of God according to the manhood, One and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten to be acknowledged in two natures, inconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably, the distinction of natures being by no means taken away by the union, but rather the property of each nature being preserved and concurring in one person and one subsistence, not parted or divided into two persons, but one in the same Son and only begotten, God the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the prophets from the beginning have declared concerning him. And the Lord Jesus Christ himself has taught us. And the creed of the Holy Fathers has handed down to us. Now, lest we we think that these nuanced statements should be reserved for eggheads and theologians, I do think we should consider from our passage two critical implications of Jesus becoming fully human in every way. The first is that Jesus had to be fully human in order to serve as our representative. Again, if we were to go back to Genesis, we see that Adam, our first representative, failed us. And since that day, the only way that anyone could have any sort of a relationship between God and man 
is to continue that through a mediator. Under the old covenant system, this required the services of a high priest. And if we were to read on in the book of Hebrews, we would see that one of the major themes of this letter is that the office of high priest was at best a temporary fix. It ultimately pointed to the need for a great high priest. And that is exactly who Jesus is. The Son of God became a man in order to become our perfect representative, our merciful and faithful high priest. But second, the Son of God became a man in order to become our perfect substitute. You'll notice there at the end of verse 17 that Jesus is described as the one who makes atonement or propitiation for the sins of the people. Not only did the Son of God become fully man to represent us before the Father, Jesus became one of us in order that he might serve as our substitute to bear the full penalty that is due us for our sin. That's the wrath of God. Now we've looked at these four reasons why the Son of God became a human being, and we've looked at the why of Christmas so that when we come to these more familiar stories this season, maybe we'll see those familiar scenes in a fresh light. And one of the things that we love most about this time of year, about Christmas, are the the songs that we sing. And as we get ready in a moment to sing again together, I want you to consider this. Back in verse 12, we read one more quotation from the Psalms. And it's attributed to Jesus. And so it's as if Christ is saying, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. Do you know what that means? It means that this Christmas... This morning, as you sing, as we sing this season, words like joy to the world, the Lord is come, let earth receive her king. Or as you sing, Gloria in excelsis Deo. Or as you sing, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity, pleased is man with us to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. You see, as you sing these familiar songs, our text is telling us that Jesus, the Son of God incarnate, is singing praise to his Father right along with us, his brothers and his sisters, who share in his humanity. And I can think of no better way to respond to the good news of the Son of God made fully man for us than to sing with joyful praise to Him. Let's pray together. God, there are so many things that we love to focus on this time of year. Father, so many good things celebrating this season. Father, would you point us to what is most important? Not only the what of the Christmas story, but why it happened. Lord, and as we reflect on that today and perhaps into this week, as we do sing familiar Christmas hymns and Christmas songs, Lord, would you point us back to the glory of your Son's incarnation, that he would become one of us, that we might be reconciled to you, that we might be restored, that we might receive forgiveness. Lord, that you would restore us to your intention for us in glory. Father, these things we celebrate in Jesus' name. Amen.